Over these next two weeks, I want to preach a very short series. Um, it's actually going to be my last series here. Um, if you all don't know me, my name is Paul Hubart. I'm the lead minister. I've been the lead minister here for eight years at Grace Chapel. And in mid-July, we'll be uh, moving down uh, south to Florida to, to start a new work there. And so I've been thinking, what, what would I like to share in the last couple of weeks that, that I get to speak with you all? And so kind of reading, praying, kind of digging into Scripture, and, and a theme jumped out at me. And really, this could be a two-week, a four-week, a six-week series, with often as the Apostle Paul uses this theme as he is encouraging a church that he spent time with, Sometimes, in the case of Ephesus, for example, a church he spent several years with, and other churches that he only got to know some of the people there who maybe went and planted and established that church, as we'll see next week. And in this case, a church that he had spent time with in Philippi on his second missionary journey. And so we're going to entitle this series, Continue, A Parting Encouragement. The word continue is kind of an interesting word. It's a word that we use pretty often. We take it for granted. In fact, maybe it's, it's one that we're familiar with, but maybe we actually don't use it all that often in our English vocabulary and vernacular. But it means very simply this. Continuance is the idea of persisting in an activity or process. And so typically when you're calling somebody to continue to do something, it's because they're doing something that's good and you want them to keep doing what they're doing. Don't stop that thing you're doing. It Maybe you go to the doctor's office and he says, hey, listen, I want you to continue taking this medication. Continue taking this medication because this medication is helping whatever condition that you've got. If you've got high blood pressure, continue taking this beta blocker because it's having a positive effect on your blood pressure right? So it's a good thing. Keep doing this thing that you're doing. Or maybe you go to a physical therapist. Listen, I've worked with you for the last month and your shoulder is improving. It's getting a whole lot better, but I want you to continue these exercises at home. And I see some of you guys working out your shoulders and kind of smiling when we talk about blood pressure medication. So you're familiar with this idea, right? Keep doing these things that you're doing that were positive, that were good for you. Or maybe as we have been, many of us kind of visited graduation, some of you, your children graduated high school this year, and often one of the themes at graduation, whether it's high school or college, is listen, all the things that you've been doing in this setting, these good habits that hopefully you've developed, don't stop doing those things in the next phase of your life. Don't stop. The good things that got you this far often will help you get further. So keep doing these things. Persist in these good positive activity or processes. Don't stop doing the things you're doing. And it's amazing, again, how often this is a message of the Apostle Paul to these churches that he's been connected with. The good things you're doing, keep going, keep pressing on, press deeper, further into these good works, these good habits, your relationship with the God who loves you, press deeper into that relationship. So we're going to see this morning, the Apostle Paul use this word continue as he writes to this church in Philippi, a church that was fairly newly established. One of the churches that was definitely Gentile, that means non-Jewish, predominated by Gentiles. There was no synagogue in Philippi for Paul to go to first and try to establish a church in. In fact, you may remember the scene from Acts 16 where the Apostle Paul and his disciple Silas are sitting in prison and there's this earthquake, right? And the Philippian jailer goes and, I mean, it's, it's a wild, crazy story. You may remember these stories. So Paul had newly established this church. On his second missionary journey, he's writing not too far separated from that. This church meant a lot to him, as did every church he planted or had a chance to be connected with. And so as he writes them, he writes with this message, continue, don't stop doing those things that you've been doing that draw you deeper into relationship with the God who loves you, with the God you're coming to love more deeply and follow and serve more faithfully. So if you got your Bibles, I'd invite you to open up to Philippians chapter 2. And this is what the Apostle Paul says on the heels of, you may be familiar with Philippians chapter 2, where he said, listen, 
I want you, in the way you think about each other, I want you to have the same mindset, the same heart, the same attitude as Jesus. And then he talks about Jesus leaving behind his position in heaven, taking on the form of a servant, becoming obedient even to death. And Paul says, that's how you guys ought to treat each other. So he talks about that, and then he jumps into that, and that's why we have this word, therefore. He says, therefore, my dear friends, you can see the love in that first sentence. Therefore, my dear friends, he says, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, not only when I was there with you, were you faithful, says the Apostle Paul. He says, but now much more even in my absence. I'm not here with you, and you're continuing, Paul says, continue now. Continue, here's our word, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Now, what can we say about the Apostle Paul? What what can we say about what the Apostle Paul has just shared with these disciples who he calls his dear friends whom he loves? What can we say? Well, the Apostle Paul is first letting them know that God is doing the work of salvation in you, but you have to continue to work your salvation out. That's kind of confusing, right? I mean, what what, what does that really mean? Like, God is doing this work in us, but we've got to work something out. And the work that we're doing is tied to this understanding of salvation, this knowledge of salvation, living in salvation. How do we kind of flesh this out? And I use the word kind of flesh intentionally there because I'm going to put on screen the picture of, I mean, no, not really me. Think about your your muscular structure. This is one of the best kind of illustrations that I have seen that helps me make sense of this, this idea of working in what God is doing and working out what we're called to do in relation to this gift of salvation that we've been given. So I think this is what the Apostle Paul is trying to say again, because I acknowledge this is kind of confusing. These concepts are a little bit heady. So what is the Apostle Paul trying to say? Well, I think if we were to look at it in a way that we would understand, we might say this, that that our muscular structure, your muscular structure was given to you. But if you want it to grow, you're going to have to work it out. Right? Anybody ever around like the the turn of the new year found themselves in a gym again? Maybe it's like the fifth again for you or the 50th again for you. I don't know what it is, but here we are. We're in the gym again. Why? Because it's been a while since we have done this thing called working out. I mean, it's interesting. We call it working out, right? I mean, we're taking what's been given to you, what is in us, But if we want that that is in us to grow, we have to work it out. So you go to the gym, and maybe you go all the way to the extreme of hiring a personal trainer, right? So you're now paying somebody to help you learn how to work out and how to grow your muscles more fully because you don't necessarily know how to do this, so you need a coach. And so you start working out. And and it's wild with working out. Like the first thing that happens when you work out is you get really sore right? Been there, done that? You get really sore, and then a couple weeks go by, and you start to kind of look at yourself, and you're like, hey, nothing's really happening here. Is this, is this working out thing actually working out for me? And then if you stick with it, you find maybe that after a month, you start to notice, hey, something is growing here. And then two months, and then three months, and then six months, and if you were to stick with it for a year, which let's be honest, nobody does because we're back at the gym again the next year, so we didn't really stick with it. But if we had Can you imagine what would have happened? What would have continued to grow in us if we had stuck with it? You know, what's wild too is I've been in this phase where I, I, I probably have worked out for several years continuously at times. You know what's crazy? You can work out for two years and take two months off and then go back to the gym and notice, I can't do this like I did just two months ago. Or if you're a runner and you try to get back out there and run again, I I can't run as fast as I did just two months ago. I spent two years training and now I took two months off and I can't run like I, I did. And so I think that may be an illustration that helps us kind of get our minds around what the Apostle Paul is trying to tell this church in Philippi. 
and what we ought to challenge ourselves to, to have a good understanding of this fact that we've got something in us that God has given to us, but what is in us has to be worked out. You don't just sit back and say, well, good thing, God saved me, wonderful. No, we work out what God put in us. And so the Apostle Paul says this to this church in Philippi and would say this to us as well, continue to work out your salvation. But then he puts this qualifier on it. He doesn't just say, listen, guys, continue to work out your salvation next verse. The Apostle Paul says, I want you to continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Now, now what does that mean? I mean, the idea of fear is not one we often look at positively, but there are some things to be afraid of, and that's positive. I'm a little nervous sometimes when my kids, my two boys especially, are not afraid of snakes, and I'm like, hey, there are some snakes you should be afraid of. Don't pick that snake up. Hey, you notice that one has a diamond-shaped head? Let's stay away from that one. If you play with its tail, you may still get the fangs, so be careful. Right? There are some things it's good for us to have a healthy fear or even awe of. And so I think what the Apostle Paul is saying is something like this. The fact that God has saved you is a fact that you should continually be in awe of and it should move you to a response. I mean, If I'm just honest and I I think about me, and and I know a lot of things about me that you don't know about me. I know what I think in my mind sometimes, and guess what? God knows that too. So like the Apostle Paul who says, man, I'm a wretch. Who, Who will save me from me? And then he says, man, by the grace of God, praise God that he has saved me. And that was the Apostle Paul, who had turned, I mean, by all accounts and measures, by what we know, completely turned his life around. 180 degrees, walking this way, persecuting Christians, holding the jackets as Christians had rocks thrown at them, signing letters, going to get letters signed, trying to go persecute, persecute more Christians on the moment, in the moment that he comes to see Jesus for the first time. And it's like he does a 180. But he still says, man, if you knew me the way I knew me and the way that God knows me, it would blow your mind that God has saved me. And so the fact that God has saved you, just as it was for the Apostle Paul, the fact that God has saved you is a fact you should continuously be in awe of. Now, now here's the truth about us as human beings. I'm going to put something on the screen, and I I think we'll get a lot of nodding heads on this one. Here is a truth about human beings. Repetition has the potential to normalize almost any activity or experience. Here's what I mean. I'm giving an illustration from my own, my own life. When I was about 23 years old, um, I, I knew I had to do some sort of exercise because I was just sitting around the house. I, I was working in youth ministry, and at, at that point in time, youth ministry meant hang out with kids and play video games, which was a lot of fun. And I didn't, I missed the other part. Like, hang out with kids, play video games, eat pizza and wings until like 4 a.m. sometimes. And that was doing funny things to my body. Like, like I was growing, but not in the way you necessarily want to grow, right? And so I actually had a guy in the church come to me and, and say, which is, which is always interesting, you know, when people do this thing, it's like, yeah, that's in love. But boy, that was weird. Um, like, hey, I've got this spare bike if you'd like to come out and ride with me. <laughs> wink, wink. All right, I know you're looking out for me. I, I, I know. Pizza and wings and lots of video games. My thumbs were in awesome shape, though. Let me tell you what. So I, I took this bike, and I started riding with this bike, and, and pretty quickly I was like, man, I, I enjoy riding like this. This, this is a lot of fun. And so I started riding the bike. I eventually got to where I bought my own bike. I started riding with a club. And there was one day where I was out by myself. I was kind of training. And I just, most of the time, I just kind of had fun out riding. So I'm out training. And these guys go by me flying fast. And they're all wearing like the same colors. Their shoes were the same. Their bikes were all the same. And I'm like, what's the deal with these guys? 
So I thought to myself, like, I've been riding for a while. I'm going to try to see if I can catch up to these guys. And so I caught up, and I rode with them for a little bit. And it wasn't long before they, they decided to kind of take a pause. And, you know, here's this guy they'd never seen before who's, like, hanging on the back. And, I mean, that's kind of weird. But they invited me to ride with them. Now, now, that was an interesting thing when I found out who they were. They were a professional cycling team. And so I was kind of starstruck. Like, these guys, I mean, one of these guys had raced in the Tour de France, which is like the big thing in cycling, right? It's like, whoa, these guys are inviting me to come ride with them. That's awesome. And so they invited me to come ride with them that next Saturday, which ended up being a really, really bad thing because I was not in shape to do 60 miles with them as opposed to doing like five minutes with them. And so I ended up riding the rest of about half of that ride back on my own. But every time they would invite me, at least initially, I was like, this is so cool. These guys are inviting me to go ride with them. And I remember there was a morning, a Saturday morning, after I had got to know them a bit, and after I had actually been invited to be a part of the amateur side of the team, there was a Saturday morning where it wasn't all that nice outside. I mean, I think it was getting into fall of that year. The weather wasn't great. It was kind of cold. It was a little gray, a little rainy. And there was a training ride planned. And I kind of didn't want to go. Like, can you imagine that? Just a few months earlier, I was like, man, anything I could do to go ride with these guys. And a few months later, it's kind of cold. It's rainy. I'd already been out with them quite a few times. And I'm like, I don't know if I really want to get out of bed and do this. So this thing that I'd been so excited about, because I'd already done it several times, it was an experience that I'd had, an activity that I'd been a part of on a number of occasions. I wasn't as excited about it because it, it kind of become normal. Now, now, here's the thing. I mean, all right, so cycling, whatever, or an activity that you're a part of that was really cool that you got to be a part of, that first time, an activity, that's one thing. But I'm afraid that sometimes this is how we get in our relationship with God. I mean, we had that moment where, where we come to him, where we experience that new birth, where it's fresh, it's new, it's real, the new life, we feel the new life. But maybe we can move to a place where the new life gets old. And I think what the Apostle Paul would tell us is that new life that God has put in you should never get old. Never. The fact that God has saved us should be a fact that we're continually in awe of. This can be true about some things, but there's one thing that this should never be true about. Don't ever forget just how special your relationship with God is. So, back to the Apostle Paul. So, and I'm going to tell you, the so that comes after this at first is a little bit of kind of like a head scratcher. Like, wait a minute, hold on. So this, then this, right? Because the Apostle Paul is typically very logical. If this, then this. I mean, that's the way he works. He uses the word therefore over and over and over again. Because of this, then this. So the therefore that comes after this one is kind of, at least maybe on the surface, a little bit of a head scratcher at first. So he says, look, don't ever forget how special this gift is. So this is what I want you to do then. Do everything without grumbling or arguing. It almost seems like he shifts gears or like, are we missing a piece of the letter here? He jumps straight to this conversation about don't grumble, don't argue. Don't ever forget how precious the gift of God is, what God has given you. And don't grumble, don't argue. So that you may, may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault and a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word word of life. You know, what Paul is saying, and again, it may seem at first like a little bit of a leap, but what Paul is saying is basically this. Here is what a people who work out their salvation with fear and trembling look like. They do everything without grumbling and arguing. Okay, let's, let's try to bridge this gap with the Apostle Paul in case we're having a hard time understanding how this is connected directly to this. I mean, you may be saying, how, how is that one? How is that possible? How is it possible to do everything without grumbling or arguing, complaining or arguing in some texts, some translations? How is it possible to do that, one, 
And what does that actually have to do, really? Like, how, how is that directly connected to working out my salvation? Well, here's how it's connected. Remember the way that Paul ended that previous little snippet of Scripture that we looked at? He said, listen, you work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Why? Because God is at work in you. So you work out because God is at work in. And so I've got a question for you. Question for me. Do I trust that God is at work? Okay, just hang on to that one for a second. Do I trust that God is at work? And then let's add a little bit of a layer to that. Not only in me, but around me. I mean, do I trust? Ask yourself that question. Do you trust that God is at work not only in you, but also around you? And here's why that is important. Here's why it's important for me. Because I grumble and argue when I'm not content with the way things are. When I don't like the way things are, that's when I move to grumbling and arguing. You too? I mean, that makes sense, right? That's logical. We grumble, we argue, we complain when things aren't the way we want them to be, when we're not content with the way things are. And sometimes there's a piece of this that's, that's good. I want to acknowledge this. And here's how I want to acknowledge it. By saying this, there are things in this life that should create in me a strong feeling of dissatisfaction. Right? There are things in this life that ought to create with us, within us a strong feeling of dissatisfaction. I mean, when we see someone being treated unjustly, when we ourselves are treated unjustly, When, when life doesn't seem fair, or maybe life is not fair, that, that does create within us dissatisfaction. And, and maybe rightly so. Can we be honest and say that God is dissatisfied with the way things are, with the state of the world around us? God is dissatisfied. Never once do I see God grumbling and arguing. I see him lamenting. So, so what we can do in these moments where we're dissatisfied, discontent, I can grumble and I can even argue. I mean, I can do that. That's kind of the human default is to grumble and argue when things aren't the way we want them to be. Or, or I can trust that God is at work. I can search for where he's working and I can join him in the good thing he's doing, as opposed to grumbling and arguing. Are you with me? I mean, there's a big difference in that. And let me tell you this. Here's what's at stake. I wrote, it's hard. Maybe I should even put here. It should have said, it's impossible, maybe. It's hard to do good and godly things when I'm doing nothing but grumbling. Anybody ever experienced that? I mean, you, you can try to do a good thing while grumbling, but the good thing you're doing becomes a sour thing while you're doing it because you're grumbling, you're arguing. So the good thing you're doing almost doesn't even count, right? I mean, maybe you've experienced that in your marriage. Like you grudgingly do this thing that your spouse wants you to do and you do it with a bad attitude. You've been there? I mean, am, am I the only one who's going to stand and confess this this morning? Like, I've done things that Lori wants me to do with a bad attitude, and she almost looks at me like, well, I wish you actually wouldn't even done it because your attitude was so bad. So it's hard to do good things, and the things we're doing may not be that good if we're stuck in this place of grumbling and arguing. So what? So here's what I think. When I'm tempted to grumble and argue, I should instead ask, what good thing do you want me to do in this moment? Lord, how could I maybe even be a part of changing the thing that's there? And I know that may seem kind of idealistic at first, but can we be honest that the Apostle Paul really truly acknowledges the mess of this world? This isn't idealistic. Not at all idealistic. Listen again to the words that he uses. He says about this world, world that, that we live in a warped and crooked generation. I mean, I couldn't come up with better words to describe the time we're living in right now. And this is not an idealistic view of the world we're living in to say we ought to join with God in the good things he's doing in the midst of a warped and crooked generation. 
We can see the world clearly and choose to do the God thing even when we see the world clearly. Or we can see the world clearly and do the human thing and grumbling and arguing. Here's what I want to say. It's only by avoiding grumbling and arguing and joining God in doing good that we will shine like stars in this dark world. And this is why all of this matters. So then... Or the Apostle Paul uses the words, and then, he says next, and then I will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not labor in vain. That as I joined with God in the work he was doing, in the work he was wanting me to do, and saying yes to the things he prepared in advance for me to do, as I joined with him, I didn't work in vain, says the Apostle Paul. He says, even if right now it looks like I'm being poured out, and the Apostle Paul was writing this from jail the first time that he was in jail. The Apostle Paul is writing this from a Roman prison cell, saying, look, even if I I am at this place, I think I'm going to be released this time, and he was, but even if I'm not, even if I'm being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, says the Apostle Paul, I can be glad and rejoice with all of you. What would would be natural to be doing sitting in a jail cell? Not what the Apostle Paul was doing, especially if you're unjustly imprisoned. I mean, Paul is writing the Philippians, by the way, who when he was imprisoned in Philippi, he was sitting there singing songs. And here he is again rejoicing in prison. And so he says, so... So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. So what's the and then? The and then is this. As we join God in the midst of what he's doing, as we join God in what he's doing, even in the midst of the reality of this dark and broken world where we want to grumble and we want to argue, as we instead continue to work out our salvation with fear and trembling, as we instead partner with God, as he invites us into a partnership, which is incredible to think about, we rejoice. Because like the Apostle Paul, the good we do in this world as we work out our salvation with fear and trembling, church, is never in vain. It's never in vain. Why is it not in vain? Because because of what you're doing? Well, maybe that's true. But again, remember, you're partnering with God in what he's doing. And we serve a God who can move mountains, who can change lives, who can take the darkest lives and bring light into them. If we continue. Let me pray over you. Father, it's it's my prayer over this church and over all those within the sound of my voice, whether they're watching online or here in person this morning, all those who've made the choice to follow Jesus, that they would continue to work out their salvation with fear and trembling so that they might grow in their relationship with you, God, so that they might know you more fully so that they might understand your love more deeply and so that they might shine more brightly like stars in the darkness. God, help us all to continue in you. This we ask in Jesus' name. And the church said, amen.